In fact, what happened with the next um, week, Father George is coming down. So okay. <laughs> okay. Our, Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, Hey, Kurt, I will be moderating the comments for you. So oh, great. Um, Thanks. just worry about giving the presentation and I will take care of the rest. Okay. As much as I can, since I am not co-host. Okay. But you do not have the waiting room set up, so people should be coming in and out okay. at their leisure. All right. Okay, I'm going to try to figure out how to share my screen here. Let's see. I can talk you through it if necessary. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Christine, do, do you normally optimize for video clips? I have a video clip to show. I do not use video clips, so okay. I do not know. I think that would depend on your uh, internet connection. Okay. Uh, try that. Um, so real fast, my name is Dr. Christine Boston. Uh, Kurt DeVord is obviously our speaker, but I'm gonna be moderating this. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, um, send them in the chat and I will let Kurt know when you have questions. And uh, if Kurt is so inclined, he can say, hey, do you have questions? And I can read them off the chat if you have anything um, that you posted previous. Hmm. Your screen is sharing, Kurt. Oh, it is? Yes, we can see your desktop top and some weird blue screen. Okay. There we got the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find you guys. Oh, here you are. Nope, that's not it. That's not it. Uh-oh. Clicking on Zoom. Hmm. See, I can't see anybody, so I'm I, I'm hiding myself and all you guys. Let's see. I'm gonna stop share for a second. Okay. Okay. So now I see all you guys again. So when I and it's am I recording this or are you recording this? You, uh, you are recording it, it seems. Okay, good. The host has recording abilities, and you are recording it right now, so. All right. Appreciate it. Figure some of this out. Um, uh, Kurt, when you hit share screen, you should have an option of what specific um, viewer or thing you want to show your PowerPoint, YouTube slash internet, um, that such stuff. So you can pick which one you want to share. Okay. That should come up. So right now I got share my screen. So share. And there's that. There we go. I just, I can't see myself, but I guess I don't need to. So. <laughs> No, we can see your PowerPoint. Okay. Can you see me? Um, you are in the viewers. No. Okay. Yeah, I can see you. All right. Let's see. All right, I might give it another minute here. No problem. It's your ball game from here on out. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, Kurt, when you have the participants um, option on, it blocks the PowerPoint. Oh. Can you see it now? Yeah. Unobstructed. Great.
Also, for anyone who came in a little bit late, we are recording this since we have a few people who were unable to attend tonight and did want to see it. And it will be posted to the library's YouTube page, the Missouri River Regional Library's uh, YouTube page uh, at a later date. All right, I think I'm just going to go ahead and start then. Um, thank you everybody for coming. I really appreciate this. Um, it's it's strange because I, I can't see myself and um, I, I hope I'm in the frame. Um, uh, I'm Kurt DeBoard. I'm a professor of psychology at Lincoln University. Um, I'm going to uh, describe a, a little bit about um, what I'm doing and then kind of jump into something and then take a step back and talk about um, two different timelines. So um, let's see, I'm trying to have it go page down. Let's see, sorry, I'm having a few computer difficulties. Oops. Oh, look uh, at him. Let me see, he's good at talking? Yeah. Oh. Okay, so um, uh, this is uh, Theodore Bryant, Ted Bryant, um, and I will be- <laughs> Spending a chunk of time um, talking about him. Um, I also have a recorded interview with his daughter, Ithaca. Um, he was at Lincoln University from 1962 to 1995. Um, yeah. When he retired, um, he for that position. Hey, Kurt, real yeah. fast. Uh -huh. uh, everyone who is on the Zoom call, please mute your mics. You, Whenever your mic is live, it interrupts Kurt's speech. And that is distracting to the audience. So again, if you are not Kurt DeBoard, please mute your mic. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> um, so he, uh, Ted retired in 1995 and um, I uh, applied for the position that um, he vacated. And one of the things that um, really I started thinking about um, putting together this talk uh, um, early last year, because I realized that um, this year I'll be eligible for retirement as a April. Um, I could retire from Lincoln University after being here for uh, 26 years. Um, and uh, kind of in related vein, uh, I took this picture yesterday. Um, when I when Ted retired, um, then I occupied his office. Um, th there was a the drawer right under the um, well. The, I, we didn't ha even have computers back then. You had to bring your own. Um, that drawer was really hard to open up. It was very stuck and. Uh, and I felt like, you know what, I'm borrowing this office, I'm borrowing this desk, I'm here temporarily. Um, and uh, I, 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 get, I get to be fortunate enough to, um, to have a position here at Lincoln. And so I took this picture as a way of symbolizing like, this will be passed on eventually then when I retire. And so much <laughs> of the drawer belongs to Ted Bryant because I never cleaned it out. <laughs> also, uh, before we're really getting going, I'd like to thank uh, Ithaca Bryant and Mark Schleer. Um, Ithaca uh, helped fill me in on so much about her family. This could also be called um, the Bryants Find a Home at Lincoln University. Um, mm -hmm. Also at the library, um, helped me. Uh, he loaned me some pictures. He did so much. He scanned all the university bulletins that I was able to research. Um, also, Dr. Tony Holland was my department chair when I um, hired in. And I've communicated with all the folks listed here, emails and phone calls and um, other things. Um, uh, Bill Binicky, Patricia Rutledge and Robert Hancock uh, were all colleagues of mine and of Ted's um, when I hired in. Uh, Noel Hermance made a special trip to campus to visit with me and, and talk about his recollections of Ted and, and what Lincoln was like at that time. And Stephen Minke also um, uh, helped with uh, doing some research, uh, trying to dig through the archives and found that unfortunately the state of Missouri um, had misplaced um, the, uh, the work history of Ted Bryant. So um, I didn't have all the research stuff that I wanted, but I really appreciated his help in reaching out and trying to find that. These were some important sources that I use in, um, in putting together some of the things I'd like to talk about. One is Dr. Holland's book, uh, The Soldier's Dream Continued, A Pictorial History of Lincoln University. Um, even the Rat Was White. Um, that's a, a book by Robert Guthrie. Um, and that, <laughs> as, as a Black psychologist coming into psychology, is like everybody was white and even the Rat was white. 
Um, <laughs> and then we have the history of the Association of Black Psychologists, which I will um, go into some detail about in a little bit. <laughs> Showing this slide, this is a slide I show in the first week of my introductory psychology class. Um, this is uh, in the in the history of psychology chapter. Um, they say that psychology started in Germany in 1879 with Wilhelm Wundt um, and the structuralist. Um, and so I describe that and say, you know, th this was um, an attempt to basically take psychology and make it a science, an empirical science. Um, they were interested in the elements of the mind. Um, they used introspection, but not introspection in a way where you just kind of free associate and talk about things, but more about um, what Wundt was interested in was sensations and feelings that he would ask his uh, participants in his studies yes or no questions, and they would tap like a telegraph tapper um, to like respond, and they were trying to get some insight in what the elements of the mind were. But I asked my students, is do you think this is when people really first started thinking about psychology? Um, and again, this is when psychology was attempting to become an empirical science. Uh, and then I, I show them this, and I say, you know, we have um, evidence from ancient Kemet civilization of Egypt um, that there's evidence of the interest in study of thought and motivation and intention. Um, and, and some of the writings that have been discovered from there about the study of the soul and the spirit, um, way of thinking about how long humans have been thinking about psychological issues. Um, this concept of mot, um, how a person's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors align with the truth. Um, that is part of more of an African philosophy that when I start talking about the three branches of Black African psychology, um, that Asa Hilliard um, really popularized. He actually transitioned and changed his name to Nana Bafur Amankwatia II, um, and he was one of the founders of the Association of Black Psychologists. So when I show my students this, they're like, oh, yeah, it makes sense that humans would be thinking about this stuff for a long time. If you go into um, a, a history of psychology textbook, actually, that's used at Lincoln, used at um, most universities around the country, um, they will start listing and, and, and describing all the you can see philosophers that are listed there. And um, <laughs> Aurelius and the Stoics, um, I talk about the Sto Stoicism in my uh, therapies class. Um, you have, you know, these famous philosophers, including Hegel. Um, <clears throat> and Hegel um, had a fair amount of influence uh, in the early 1800s. He became the uh, department chair of philosophy um, at the University of Berlin around that time. But he's also um, infamous uh, for this quote here, that Africa has no history and did not contribute to anything that mankind enjoyed. Um, this really, I think, tells a story of how um, Eurocentric psychology was um, in its early days. If you look at colonial Africa and you think about how imperialism and colonialism and just white supremacy just uh, suppressed um, African philosophy and African thought um, uh, and became so Eurocentric focused. Uh, also, I talked to my class about how it ignored all of um, Eastern thought as well, but I mean, it was active suppression in Africa of the philosophies that could have influenced um, modern U.S. psychology to be a better thing than it is today. So with that being said as kind of a context, um, I mentioned that I want to describe two timelines that I would like to interweave back and forth. And I show this uh, picture here, of this stream. On the right is me and Dr. Um, Cal Johnson from Lincoln University on a float trip because we have done that several times. And as we go through these timelines, it's going to be kind of like the streams, like, like I'll be talking about a little bit about Lincoln, and I'll say now I'd like to take a step back and go more on the national scene and talk about psychology and eventually how black psychology um, formed. Do you know him? No. Why don't you sit down and listen to something? If, if you could please uh, mute your microphone, I'd greatly appreciate that. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I um, want to start with Lincoln University, and this is a, a um, picture that Mark Schleer uh, uh, let me borrow here. I thought that was a great picture of the Hill um, in the Lincoln Institute in the early days. Um, if you look at um, our history, obviously we were founded in 1866 um, by the 62nd and 65th um, Colored Infantries um, from the Civil War, um, and I show I've been really fortunate enough. I show this picture um, whenever I get to travel and talk about Lincoln. And I've, uh, uh, as a faculty member at Lincoln, I've had the privilege um, to be able to go on sponsored trips and talk about Lincoln um, to places like Japan and Taiwan and China 
Uh, when I showed these two pictures in China, they were really impressed by the picture on the right of uh, getting a hand up through education. And so when I talk about the founding of Lincoln University, um, uh, when I get to travel, I, I show this these two pictures regularly. I'm going to go back here then, as you may recall, even like, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a proclamation, um, uh, I guess uh, <laughs> proclaimed by um, Carrie T. Turgan, I'm sorry, the uh, mayor of Jefferson City and the Honorable Dave uh, Griffith uh, to President Woolfolk, um, uh, recognizing that the hundred years that um, Lincoln has been now named Lincoln University instead of Lincoln Institute. And actually it was uh, the first um, African-American legislator who proposed that, um, that the name change be done in 1921. Actually one of his, um, uh, I think, I can't remember how, what relations, one of his relations was there um, to also um, be honored in those proclamations. I'm going to then talk a little bit more about the history of Lincoln. And I'd like to start with Inman Page. You may be familiar with that name the, the, because of the name of Page Library. Um, he's a, quite an impressive person. Um, he became the president of uh, Lincoln Institute at the age of 26. So the board had a fair amount of trust in this, this man. Um, and I think it was well-deserved given what he was able to do at Lincoln. He was born into slavery. Um, he purchased his family's freedom. He studied at Howard, obviously HBCU and Brown University then. Um, he had memorial hall built, um, which was uh, uh, had like a gym on one floor and a library on another it was a good resource for the campus. Um, but according to Dr. Holland's book, um, he was also really known for bringing in and, and recruiting outstanding teachers. Um, he regularly uh, petitioned the Missouri legislature uh, for funding as uh, history of Lincoln University, that has been a theme to make sure that, um, that Lincoln is properly funded. Um, but when he did so, he would take the Lincoln Institute, Lincoln Institute singers with him uh, to the chambers of, uh, of the legislative chambers of the state house and uh, to show them what, how sophisticated our students were and what they were capable of. Um, I, I bring him into this picture here because not only was he president of Lincoln University, he also taught psychology. Um, and he taught it um, from the perspective of a, a book that was written by James Sully which in these days we would consider to be somewhat gestalt oriented in psychology, really looking at the interrelation of things um, in terms of their contrast and how similar they are um, and the laws of association. If you look at, these are two pages from um, different bulletins and I'm afraid that my little bar here is blocking this from, uh, again, I appreciate um, Mark Schler and copying these for me, but these are, pages from these early bulletins um, from late 1800s, obviously. And you can see that Page is listed as a professor of mental and moral science early, and then a professor of ethics and psychology. Um, and a lot of the early psychology was taught with um, developing a good moral character. What was it again? Hold on a second. There we go. Uh, and this is another page from that, uh, one of those two bulletins that talks, uh, shows what resources they used in uh, teaching the psychology class at Lincoln back in the late 1800s. Um, and you can see Sully's book listed. Also though, there's a, an, an indication that a philosophy book was used. Um, and that was one of the things that psychology overall uh, was trying to differentiate itself from, was from philosophy um, that was housed uh, psychology was originally housed in philosophy departments in universities um, in Europe um, and in the U.S. If you look then, um, now Page had two presidencies, and between those two presidencies became, um, came um, Benjamin Allen, um, who was uh, a president from 1902 to 1918. Um, he also taught psychology at Lincoln University. Um, uh, but between um, the years of 1898 and 1902, before Allen came to be president, um, Lincoln apparently went through a series of presidents, some lasting only as long as the governor lasted in, in his office, um, and one apparently lasting less than 24 hours, according to uh, Sherman Savage, who uh, has written the famous book, I think from 1939, called The Period of Presidents. Um, oh, no, he called that the period of presidents. 
Um, Alan was very interested in having his students um, be of good moral character. And he said things like ethics existed for practice, culture for use and brains for industry. He brought in um, uh, uh, politicians and famous speakers to, um, to have the students exposed to them. He, he was aware that he had a liberal arts kind of bias as his own approach. And so to kind of balance that out, he emphasized teacher education and industrial arts. This was the person that also wrote the words to Lincoln O. Lincoln, which I sing at least a couple times a year. Um, and his report um, to the board in 1910 said the faculty was making a special effort to inculcate in the students such virtues as diligence, family affection, and forthfulness. I have some pages here from the 1911 and 1912 um, bulletin where you can see that not only was he president, but he taught ethics and psychology at Lincoln. And these are a few more pages from that same bulletin. And you can see, I'm gonna to have to move this here too. It says prohibitions, the associations of the opposite sex in any form without permission. Um, apparently during his time, number two, um, if you were caught playing cards or, or throwing dice, uh, you'd be expelled from the university. Um, so no use or possession of any immoral literature. Uh, so it was a clear conduct code for the students. And then also things that were required like proper observance of the Sabbath. Um, that was apparently common in universities across the country. So that was not particular to Lincoln University. Um, also, you can see on the left that um, in the normal school that, that they would accept um, candidates as, as young as 15 years old at that time. Not only during Allen's um, presidency did they have strict moral and, and behavior codes for the students, they also had them for the faculty. So a little trouble with my page down and page up. Here are some suggestions for teachers. And <laughs> I thought these were interesting. Um, keep on studying men and books, get in touch with the world and be a part of it. Um, don't grow careless about your English. Read the best literature as a pastime. I like this, lend others a helping hand, obviously a good idea. But start, it starts to get a little bit harsher. Don't get lazy and quit studying and don't expect anybody to boost you. So these were the kinds of uh, conduct codes not only recommended then for students, but also recommended for faculty during um, Allen's presidency. During um, his time when he was teaching psychology, um, you can see here um, some of the resources that were used in, in different classes that were taught at Lincoln, obviously when German sought selections from best authors. But in psychology here, you see that the name James is listed. And William James was a famous philosopher and psychologist um, who really made it big on the national scene and actually helped define psychology in America. And it's to him that I turn now. So I'm going to show a, a slide like this when I try to shift from one timeline to another when I have been talking a lot about Lincoln at this point, but now I'd like to take a step back and talk a little bit about psychology on the national scene um, in the first half of the 20th century. So William James, um, uh, around the time in 1911, when I was just talking about um, Benjamin Allen, um, was, uh, well, before I talk about him, I should say that there was a study done of, um, around that same time in 1912, of um, universities and colleges that were predominantly white institutions and of the 39 responses received, what they found that 27 of those universities had psychology laboratories, which were really then invested in making psychology and empirical science. And then some programs are still part of the philosophy department. So it was really kind of a mix across the country about how psychology was defining itself nationally. William James really made a difference in that. Um, he was referred to as a psychological pope of the new world in the third International Congress of Psychology. Um, his book, Principles of Psychology, I'm sure was the book that Benjamin Allen was using when he was teaching psychology at Lincoln University. Um, his ideas um, really were the, spread the seeds of functionalism and pragmatism. His thought was if an idea works, it's valid. Um, but this, he, he kind of created somewhat of a contradiction for himself um, because he was trained as a medical doctor uh, and he believed in the materialistic mechanistic view of the world but he found it to be completely depressing. Um, so depressing that he contemplated suicide. Um, it was at that point that he thought, well, I mean, I, it might be worthwhile to think about the possibility of free will. And the quote from him, him was then, my first act of free will will sh shall be to believe in free will. <laughs> and he just allowed for these two things to coexist simultaneously. 
the acceptance of the mechanistic view, which was necessary for having psychology be an, empirical, uh, an emp empirical science, and also um, the the more kind of phenomenological view. Um, and he argued that there are some things that empirical science can't really assess in the human experience. And so it's worthwhile to allow for both of these. So his, his, this contradiction and the question that he set forth, what is the function of behavior, clearly influenced by Darwin, um, set the foundation for all of American psychology to come. Um, the fact that phenomenology, phenomenology was allowed or even given credit um, really even sets the stage for um, uh, the humanistic approach in psychology um, later on. Uh, William James was also the mentor of another famous psychologist by the name of G. Stanley Hall. Uh, that is not him on the right. Um, G. Stanley Hall uh, was a student of James, and he set up the first psychology lab um, in the United States. He also founded the American Psychological Association, and he was president of Clark University. But one interesting thing about um, Hall was that he open, openly solicited black students to apply to Clark University. And so that being done, uh, and you can see there were not many PhDs that were being awarded in the US from the time of 1876 to 1920 for African-Americans. Um, over 10,000 PhDs were awarded, only 11 were to African-Americans. This was, uh, the picture on the right is of Francis Sumner and he was the um, first black man to earn a PhD in psychology in the US. Um, and again, he was accepted into Clark University by um, G. Stanley Hall. Uh, he defended his dissertation in 1920 uh, eventually, he became chair of the psychology department at Howard University. Um, he was considered to be um, Howard's most stimulating scholar by some and a fellow of the American Psychological Association. Um, so again, right now, I'm starting to try to draw together some of the um, seeds of what happened with black psychologists in the US um, during this time period. His most famous student was Kenneth Clark, which I will um, refer to in just a minute. You may be familiar with Kenneth and Mamie Clark. Um, Kenneth Clark said of Sumner himself, he said, Professor Sumner had rigorous standards for his students and he didn't just teach psychology, he taught integrity. And uh, although he led the way for um, other blacks in psychology, Sumner would permit no nonsense about there being anything like black psychology any more than he would have allowed any nonsense about black astronomy. In this and in many other ways, Sumner was a model for me. In fact, he's always been my standard when I evaluate myself. So when I'm laying that groundwork to indicate that when I start talking about the three branches of black African psychology, Clark, um, Sumner, others were in the more traditional approach. Before I say more about Kenneth Clark and, um, and Mamie Clark, I do want to acknowledge that the first um, female um, black PhD in psychology was um, Inez Prosser. And uh, one of the things that you see about um, what happens at HBCUs with psychology is that it tends to focus on educational psychology. And there's a good reason for that. Um, the, the um, obviously the predominant um, way of teaching at predominantly white universities um, uh, had racism interwoven into a lot of its teaching. And a, a lot of psychologists were invested in trying to um, uh, find some evidence that whites were somehow uh, mentally superior to black people. And so, you have people like uh, Martin Jenkins, who came along in the 1940s, so gets going a little bit ahead, who published over 80 articles, uh, most of them demonstrating no difference in intelligence between black and whites at all. Um, but going back to uh, Inez, she, she worked at uh, like a number of different HBCUs, and while she was doing that, she was finishing her PhD. She did finish her PhD in 33, but then on her way back home to Louisiana, um, she unfortunately suffered from a car accident and... Um, and, and which cut short her career and her life. Um, her, uh, her goal was to help um, elementary school kids and college kids with, with the, what she was researching in psychology. You can see what I have at the bottom of this slide is a, a piece from the, um, one of the early bulletins at Lincoln University illustrating that we did have an educational psychology class offered on the books at that time. I mentioned that I would um, talk a little bit um, oh, before I, I do that, I'm sorry, I forgot that I, I wanted to give you a quote from the book, uh, um, Even the Rat Was White. Um, Robert Guthrie said, so while white institutions provided for psychology to be, to be taught as a laboratory science and made strenuous efforts to make psychology emulate the hard sciences, black institutions were forced to narrow the discipline to practical applications. A most important aspect in the teaching of psychology in the black colleges was the de-emphasis on the alleged hereditary basis for differences in intelligence among the races, among individuals, races, and social class, points often stressed in mainstream colleges and universities. 
So you see in HBCUs a, a strong emphasis on educational psychology. Um, as I mentioned, um, one of Francis Sumner's first students was, was Kenneth Clark. And Kenneth and Mamie both went to Howard University and graduated from there. And they met and, and ended up marrying and then ended up going to um, Columbia University um, and getting their PhDs, both of them did. Um, and their work really became a basis for social justice. They were completely in invested in social justice. They, in Harlem, they set up clinics, um, both for mental health and physical health for children um, around the district. Um, Mamie's thesis research, um, you may have heard of the Clark studies, uh, was to sh um, show black school children um, baby dolls that were identical except for skin tone and say, which one's most like you and which one's the better doll, which one's the better behaved doll. And from the data that she collected, she concluded that the separate but equal school systems that we had in the US was not working. It was actually damaging black school children. Um, and her, her study results then were used by Thurgood Marshall um, because he was the chief counsel for the NAACP and the Brown versus the Board of Education um, uh, conclusion there. Um, so uh, psychology has had an influence on the national scene um, for some time. And obviously then at Lincoln, because, because of the Brown versus Board of Education, Lincoln University officially integrated in 1955. And so with that being said, I'm going to move it back, the talk a little bit to bring the timeline to Lincoln University during the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, some of you may have seen this uh, ebony cover. Um, after Lincoln integrated, there was a special done on Lincoln University. And I like the little byline there that says, the school that was too good to die. Um, and that was largely because um, presidents such as Earl Dawson uh, were fighting for more funding every time the Missouri legislator wanted to cut the funding to Lincoln University. Um, but because of, again, the, the Brown versus the Board of Education, um, you can see the differences uh, in what the um, student population looked like at Lincoln. In fall of 54, there were only 18 white students, half of which were women. And then four years later, you had about a third of the student population being white. So it was a, a big influx that was pretty sudden. From the Ebony Magazine article, um, there was a quote that said, whites mix freely on campus and they participate in all student programs. Um, so during the 50s, you uh, see, actually, we were short on housing during that time. And, uh, and President Dawson um, worked to have two of the halls that we still have on campus now, Martin and Perry, to be built during that time. Also, this is the bulletin from that same time period, 1958. Uh, that bench I sat on um, several times overlooking Richardson um, just to take a break. And, uh, and you can see psychology was included in the Department of Education um, during that time period. It was not a major or a minor. It was basically like an area. <laughs> Uh, the research that um, Mark was able to pull together on the Lincoln University bulletins basically shows that psychology as a class came and went throughout the years. Um, it's high point uh, early on was the 1940s where there were six courses and three instructors, but there was no major or minor. Um, it wasn't until um, I'm 53 that a minor was offered. And then in 66, the Department of Psychology was established at Lincoln with a minor offered with the following year, uh, officially, the undergraduate degree began in psychology with 15 different courses. I'm going to shift gears once again to go from an emphasis on Lincoln to taking a step back to see what was happening more on the national scene, especially during the 1960s when there was a lot of movement happening. Um, if you look from 1920 to 1966, there were about 10,000 PhDs granted by major universities in psychology. Less than 1% were granted to African Americans with several schools awarding none at all. In 1976, about 3% of the PhDs in psychology were awarded to African-Americans. And in 93, about 4%. So this gives you a, a sense about how psychology um, has been. Partially because of that, largely because of that. And also um, because of what was happening in the country politically at the time. In September 68, just a few months after Martin Luther King was assassinated, a group of black psychologists in San Francisco got together and formed their own organization called the Association of Black Psychologists. Um, and they, they had, they actually petitioned American Psychological Association for more black representation in the APA. Uh, they uh, petitioned for more student education um, and for APA to use its resources to address um, poverty and racism and the misuse of intelligence testing. Um, and so the, it's called ABSI uh, for psycho psychology, so the Association of Black Psychologists. 
um, uh, so has been big and existing um, ever since that time. Actually, the first president of uh, ABCI was Robert Williams. I think somebody has a TV on. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Robert Williams, um, actually, I, one of the reasons I refer to him, not only was he the, the first president of ABCI, um, he was at WashU and he was director of African American Studies and the, a full professor of psychology. He actually um, created a 10 point program for changing um, graduate education and psychology that um, he sent out to 300 universities and 35 of those adopted it straight out just exactly as, as he said how the changes should be made, which included more funding for black students. Um, he's also famous uh, for the Black Intelligence Test of Cultural Homogeneity um, showing, which is an interesting acronym, showing that basically you, if you write your intelligence test based on cultural references, you're going to get biased results. And he showed that his black students could perform way better than white students on the on the test that he was coming up with. ABCI eventually came up with its own definition for black and African psychology. And I, I didn't put the entire thing there because it's quite lengthy, but I pulled out a couple of the pieces of it that I think are worthwhile. Um, black African-centered psychology is a dynamic manifestation of unifying African principles, values, and traditions. So going back to the idea of MOT that I talked about in the first slide, it is a self-conscious centering of psychological analyses and applications in African realities, cultures, and epistemologies. Relying on the principle of harmony within the universe as a natural order of existence. I, I actually talk a lot about harmony in my social psychology classes and, um, and how in collective societies, um, that is a unifying force in comparison to individualistic societies like the US. Um, so black African-centered psychology recognizes the spirit that permeates everything that is, the notion that everything in the universe is interconnected, the value that the collective is the most salient element of existence, and the idea that communal self-knowledge is the key to mental health. Um, that, I mean, I think about um, just communal self-knowledge. Uh, I mean, mental health has been challenged across the country during this past year and a half with COVID, and, and adopting an approach like this um, could have made a big difference. I'm referring here now to an article that was published by uh, Kevin Coakley and Ramya Garba. Um, Kevin Coakley actually was at the University of Missouri um, in uh, the counseling psychology program for some time. Now he's at the University of Texas at Austin. But this was from three years ago, an article they published in the Journal of Black Psychology, which is the official journal of ABCI um, that started when the association started. And basically they identify three branches, the traditional, the reform, and the radical. And the traditional basically uses the typical psych psychological methods, Eurocentric methods, um, and critiques current psychology. And I would argue that's where we have been at Lincoln and that's where we are today. Um, the reform basically recognizes distinct uh, black psychology is separate from white psychology um, and attacks the racism within the white psychology. And the radical adopts more of an African-centered conceptual framework. For black, psychology, for black psychology by emphasizing African culture and philosophy. And the idea in the radical approach is to transform Blacks' attitudes towards themselves. And there you see Asa Hilliard that I referred to before. So of these three different branches, again, I would argue that Lincoln has been firmly embedded within the traditional. So seeing kind of like what was happening with Black psychology on the national scene, I'm going to go back then to Lincoln and talk about what was happening um, uh, right when the psychology major was established in the Department of Psychology in 1967. There, there were three professors, as you can see listed there in the bulletin, including Professor Johnson, Ted Bryant, and Gerald Downey. Um, it's stunning when I look at the courses required for the major, um, these are the same classes we have today, pretty much. Um, uh, since this uh, time, I think that um, I know I have added a um, introduction to psychotherapies class and Dr. Holman has uh, introduced a class on sports psychology, but we have this special topics um, class that uh, other areas that psychologists wanna cover typically goes into a special topics um, area. So this is really what the major has looked like for a long time. So since Ted was one of the first um, people actually to represent the psychology major at Lincoln, um, I want to say a little bit about him, and I wanted to shift it to a video here in just a moment, if I can get the video to work. Um, he was a graduate of Pepperdine University um, in clinical psychology in 1959. 
He became director of clinical psych uh, at State Hospital in Lima, Ohio. And then he and his family moved to Lincoln in 1962. And I, in some ways, like I think I mentioned earlier, this could be called not only the psychology find a home at Lincoln University, the Bryants find a home at Lincoln University because every member of the Bryant family ended up working at Lincoln University at some point. Um, the um, stories I have been able to collect from the people I spoke to about this man are just uh, incredible. I uh, wish we had footage of him. Um, he was coordinator of testing, director of counseling and testing. He was uh, director of um, institutional research. All the time, while he was director of these different offices, he was teaching two to five classes a year in psychology. He published research with Bill Benicke on the California um, personality inventory and obesity. Um, he, the state, um, Missouri State Police um, reached out to him to create an assessment because they recognized that their instruments were not admitting or allowing enough black officers. And so he helped create an assessment that would change their, their policies, basically. Um, he conducted free assessments for school kids in Jefferson City. Um, at Highway 54 Church of Christ, he was an obs um, community ombudsman, um, and he led songs there. Um, also, just as a colleague, he cared deeply about the people that he worked with. Uh, Dr. Holland uh, shared a story with me about how one of the other psychology professors had basically fallen ill and was not functioning very well, but the administration could not um, basically help him out with getting on disability and, and, and getting the help that he needed. But um, uh, when Dr. Holland turned to Ted, Ted was able to, with his kind and counseling type demeanor, um, really forge a connection with empathy and get the man help that he needed and have him connect with his family. Actually, he was able to go back um, to his family in St. Louis. If you look at some of these quotes that I've collected about Ted Bryant, um, said Ted was low keyed, um, caring about students and fellow faculty members. His common sense was very good and Ted was very thoughtful. That's from T Tony Holland. Uh, Robert Hancock said Ted exuded a peacefulness, a happy Buddha in his calmness. He was always pleasant and content. And Bill Benicke says, my recollection of Ted Bryant is that first and foremost, he had a remarkably calm, pleasant, and if you wish, even keeled approach to life. For me, he was also a valued source of feedback and, and strategies to best address problems and issues facing the psychology program. Um, and then Patricia Rutledge um, wrote to me and said, when I knew Ted, I was a total newbie. She was brand new at Lincoln University. Ted was incredibly generous with me in terms of answering my frequent questions and offering his seasoned advice. I always count on him, which meant a great deal. When he retired, I miss his calm, thoughtful, and genuine presence. When he passed much too soon after his retirement, I felt a tremendous loss. So I think hopefully you'll get a sense of who this man was um, when he was at Lincoln University. And so this time I'd like to be able to, um, to share part of an interview that I had with Ithaca Bryant. Um, and I may just have to click on that and see if that will open up. I had to open another screen, but I'm not sure if that, so let's see. This is gonna work. Patience, Obi-Wan Kenobi, patience. Exactly. Probably isn't even there anymore. Okay, so I went for it to two or sixty-three. Let's see. see. There we go. The director of counseling and testing, and then he went on to become the psychology professor, and then um, he became assistant professor. Correct? Yes. An oh, and she's talking about her dad. I, I always get that mixed up. I always say. He was associate and an assistant, but assistant comes before associate. So um, then my mom, she was, uh, she actually stayed to have my sister. She was uh, born in 1970. And so <laughs> that's telling her age. And um, so after that, she came up and she became the secretary for the president. And after the secretary for the president, she went on to become uh uh, somebody in student accounts and help the students there. And then she was in the budget office with Mr. Addison Williams. So the story I like telling about that is they worked long and hard to keep Lincoln University going and I mean, long hours. 
Well, this one particular night, she worked from eight in the morning until 11 at night. And what he likes to remind me, he actually retired. But every time he saw me after he retired, he reminded me that, you know, I remember when you were standing on the porch with that baseball bat and you said, don't you ever bring my mother home that late again. And I'm like, I, I don't really remember that, but okay. And so, oh, and my brother, he worked in the Lincoln University bookstore. And my sister, she worked in the ca uh, cashier's office, helping the students, you know, with their student accounts and things. And um, the students were very patient because they had a bell. So that whenever she was not there at the desk, they could go bing, 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 bing. Well, some of them were smart Alex, and they go bing, 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 and while she was sitting there at the desk. And um, she said, I finally got tired of that. And so she didn't work there very long. But me, I worked here in the library. And I like to tell people if I had, you know, the time that I started as a student, along with the years that I were here at the library, I would be retired by now. <laughs> but um, I started in 1979 as a student. And my dad said, you know, uh, the best place to have a job nice and quiet would probably be the library. And so Mrs. Freddie Ashford, she was um, a friend that, uh, you know, because my dad probably knew everybody. And so she was a friend. And so he said, can my daughter have a job? She said, yeah, sure. Have her come on down and, you know, try out. And so I did. They liked me. I got the job. And I've been here ever since. What happened to get for me to get the job here is that Mrs. Miss Catherine Long, she was my supervisor. Well, she became the acting librarian at the time. And so, uh, because Mrs. Freddie Ashford had passed on. And so, um, then Mrs. Dotha Black Bish, she was in the technical services area where I worked. She passed on. And so I got her job. Miss Long said, you know, this is way above your, you know, what you do because I graduated with a degree in fashion merchandising. And she said that actually this is a high school diploma kind of job. She said, but you know what you're doing and you can hit the ground running. So she let me have it. And I've been here ever since. Can you tell me what it was like for you as an undergraduate student? Me as an undergraduate student, let me tell you. Well, I went to school um, since I was here in 1962, I went to school at, in Jefferson City. And um, I was not like the other kids. And they got to have a car, you know, as soon as they got to be 16. Well, my parents were very kind to me. They, they, were, they got a house that was situated in all the school areas. So I got to walk uphill to North Gordon. Then I got to walk uphill to the middle school. Then I got to walk uphill to the high school. And then I got to walk uphill to Lincoln University. <laughs> so I got to walk up lots of hills. But to tell you all about that, what happened was um, I was mostly the only black person in my, in my you know, class. And so, you know, there was nobody else that looked like me. And I was like, hmm, okay. But then I got to Lincoln University. Oh my goodness. I mean, it was a total culture change. I mean, there was black people everywhere. I had black people as teachers. I mean, this was so cool. I was like, oh, I've, I've died and gone to Nirvana. I was like, oh, it was so neat. But you know what? I didn't really immerse myself in college life because I lived at home. I could walk uphill and go, you know, go home. So I didn't immerse myself that much in college life. Did, did you hear anything from your classmates about your dad as a teacher? Um, well, the one thing I heard about my dad was, you cannot take me. And I was like, why not? And he said, because they'll think that I gave you the job, the, you know, the grade that you got. And so I'm like, okay, fine. So I never got to take my dad as a teacher. But my friend said that he was fabulous. He was so funny. And, and he, was, he was really great as a teacher. And I'm like, what? He's, he's not like that at home. He doesn't laugh and giggle at home. 
he's he's kind of stoic and and reserved. And, and you say he laughs and giggles and and carries on like that. I'm like, okay, I'll believe you. But they said he had some really wild stories. I said about me, and they said, no, nah, not really about you. Kind of about you. And I was like. <sighs> Uh, one one last question. Can you tell me what you think about um, where Lincoln is now and its future from your perspective? Hmm, where Lincoln is now. Well, sadly, we had we were in the paper the other day about Lincoln, you know, declining in their in their um, mm. enrollment, and I was like, but uh, you know, we also had COVID, and so that kind of hurt us there. But I'm hoping and praying that we come back because it is so cool about, I love telling the story about the, um, the soldiers. And you got to show them that picture about the, the soldiers. But anyway, what happened was they gave their whole salary. Some of them gave their whole salary for a year to start this school. But they said, listen, Baxter, Richard F Foster, Faster, Baxter Foster, Foster Baxter, uh, anyway, Richard, if this school doesn't start, you got to give us our money back, okay? And he said, yes, I will definitely do that. Well, it kept on going. And it's so cool that, uh, you know, one of the soldiers sent his daughters here, and they actually graduated from this school. And so if they were here today, they would be so proud of this school and knowing how many people graduated with degrees and went on to be judges and lawyers and doctors and nurses. Oh, we have so many nurses. There's this one lady named Mary. I'll, I'll stop then. There's this one lady named Mary, and she came down where I was working in the media center. And she came down and she actually studied all the time. I mean, she would come in and get herself a study room and she would study. And that woman studied and studied and studied. And I said, one day, I said, Mary, if I ever get sick, I want you as my nurse. I said, because I know you know your stuff. And it's so cool. And, you know, usually the nurses that graduate from Lincoln University are graduated, are, are guaranteed a job, which is so cool to find out. Are there any parting comments you'd like to share? I want to thank you so much, Dr. DeBoard, for letting me do this and let me carry on and stuff. And I'm hoping that people enjoy this and that um, they might learn more about psychology and that they might um, learn more about Lincoln University. All right, and now I'm gonna shift back to my PowerPoint if I can, here we go. And th these are some pictures. I, I, really, I love working with Ithaca and she's so generous in sharing about her family. Um, and you can see um, Ted and Clara um, there on the upper left. At the bottom is Ithaca with her dad uh, after a church picnic. Um, in the middle there, um, you see uh, mom, Clara, and uh, Ithaca with her brother, Ted. And then on the right there, I like that picture because uh, that's in their front yard with uh, mom and sister, Clara. Um, you can see all the buildings of Lincoln back there. And uh, Ithaca was telling me that on Roland Street, where they lived, they had uh, all sorts of uh, Lincoln faculty there, including Mrs. Savage, um, who was an LU English teacher. Um, the Mitchell, Robert Mitchell's family was over there, too. And um, B. Moore Smith, who was a home ec teacher, and Coach Reed all lived in that neighborhood um, overlooking uh, Lincoln University. Uh, again, I just greatly appreciate how much Ithaca was willing to share with me about um, the Bryant family and their experience with Lincoln University. Uh, currently, actually since 2008, um, these have been the faculty members at Lincoln University. And uh, I have great colleagues, I love working with them. Um, and I, I really, when you start thinking about the three branches of Black African psychology, I mentioned that we are more of the traditional sense, trying to use like um, traditional methodologies and psycho psychological um, uh, methods to critique um, um, all sorts of things. I, I can really say most about myself, obviously, and Dr. Argetti and I talk about teaching every day. Um, and so I know that uh, we regularly talk about issues of race and of um, social class and just social justice issues in all our classes. I mean, my social psychology classes, that's something we talk about every day. Um, and so, but again, I would say that 
as a faculty, we're pr probably firmly entrenched in more of the traditional school of thought there. I also um, want to recognize the um, influence in my life um, and, and my career um, has been uh, Helen Neville. Um, and uh, she was a professor mentor of mine at the University of Missouri when I was doing graduate school. She was in the African-American studies program and also in the counseling psych program that I graduated from. Um, and she was co-founder and director of the Center for Multicultural Research Training and Consultation. Uh, she's now at University of Illinois uh, Champaign-Urbana. Um, she, when I took her cultural diversity class, she challenged me um, consistently. Um, one of the ways um, she uh, had us do a project and she's like, well, I mean, uh, we, ha we need resources um, for gay and bisexual men on the University of Missouri campus. Why don't you start a support group for that? And because of that, I did. I ended up for three semesters running a support group that was just a drop-in group um, uh, for gay and bisexual men there. Um, and as, because of that then, um, that led me to make connections with um, uh, peers, classmates, that eventually led to me um, being able to do what I consider to be probably my biggest contributions to psychology, would be um, uh, co-editing these three books on counseling and psychotherapy um, with lesbian, gay, and, um, and uh, transgender, bisexual people. Um, and I've been able to work with authors uh, on a national scale that's just been incredibly rewarding. Um, also, she challenged me to um, come out at Lincoln University. Um, she goes, when I walk into a classroom, students know I'm black, they see me as black, and that's that. She goes, uh, you know, you walk in, you're an invisible minority, and you get to hang on to some privilege if you don't if you come out right away. Um, based on her challenge, I came out during my job interview and I was hired. Um, so I appreciate that from Lincoln University, but also I was hired in 1995. And so that was um, a scarier time to come out to students. I eventually started, I mean, now I come out all the time and I have for years, um, but it was her thought about that and the privilege that I was hanging on to that really made me think, and I talk about this in my classes too, um, about her challenge to me. Um, these are the um, references I used in putting together this talk. And as uh, I guess Dan Turner and Mike Downey say every morning on KJLU, um, that's all she wrote, the pencil broke. And thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. DeBoer. Uh, this is everyone's opportunity to ask questions. Um, so uh, if you could please raise your hand. Um, and either myself or Kurt will call on you um, and Kurt will then answer your questions. And Kurt, you got several applause from audience members. Oh, that's nice. And Tatiana says, amazing job, so proud of you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good to see everybody. I didn't know who's, I couldn't see myself or anybody else during that whole time. So it's really unlike what I'm used to. <laughs> Uh, Dean McSwain says this was awesome. No, oh, thanks. Oh, uh, Darius has a question. Sure. Um, yes, good evening. Uh, excellent presentation, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, I was actually, I was wondering if maybe you could uh, turn the mirror a little bit and discuss your thoughts on the idea of the evolution of the psychology student over this period of time and how maybe uh, the reception of the psychology curriculum and the evolution of it has changed relative to the student at Lincoln University, maybe even just in the time that you've been there. Hmm. Wow, it's, that's a difficult thing for me. I, I'm obviously, I don't have any data on it. I was kind of just from my own personal ob observations. Um, it almost seems generational. Um, I, I know that, um, and, and I mean, it, and it's been a reciprocal influence, the students on me and me on the students. So um, I found that partially because of what they pulled from me, I have consistently made my classes incredibly more interactive. Um, when I first started, it was pretty much me lecturing. Um, before COVID hit, I would have an in-class activity in every class every day where they worked in small groups. And then based on that, they would talk with each other. Once you kind of primed the pump and got them talking to one another, then they talked to the whole class. And I mean, COVID has made me miss that drastically. Um, and, uh, and now that we have a class of freshmen that were basically sheltered during COVID and now um, haven't been able to talk to one another in classes, I'm finding that I'm faced with some of the shyest, quietest students I've ever witnessed in my life. 
And that has been a challenge by itself. And so that, that's probably the most recent transformation I've seen, but it's been so dramatic, it's almost difficult to think about anything else. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know I love working with our students. <laughs> I mean, the reason I'm not retiring is because I love working with them. But uh, yeah, I mean, that I, I'm seeing more students now apply to the graduate program in counseling at, at Lincoln. And so that's nice that that pipeline has really been kind of increased and, and we have that to offer to our students. Um, and I mean, I, I, whenever I go out in Jefferson City, although I live in Columbia, um, I run into um, former students and seeing what types of positions they have is incredibly rewarding. So I feel like our students have been achievers for some time. I hope I addressed at least partially some of your question there. Uh, Kurt Avila has a question. Hi, Hi, Avila. Hi. First of all, it was a great presentation. You know, when you hear about Lincoln, I've been working here over 20 years. So I was like, what else can you tell me? But <laughs> you did. Um, okay. And I want to say thank you for interviewing Ithaca because I mean, she just brought such joy and I had never really heard her family story to that extent. So I want to tell her thank you. Um, it also reminded me that perhaps I should suggest to you that mm -hmm. you interview more families. Every year at graduation, we honor a Lincoln family. And I don't oh. think anyone has ever done um, a book about those families that we've been honoring for the last 20 or 30 years. So you did such a good job with her interview. I think that you should write that book for us. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate yeah. that. She was great to work with. Uh, again, thanks to Ithaca. Thank you, Avila, too. I appreciate that. Um, Kurt, there was a couple comments I want to share with you um, from Victoria McBride. Great all around. I have to meet Miss Bryant. Victoria, side note, I've told you that already. <laughs> she sounds like a wonderful person with, a, with wonderful stories. I enjoyed learning about the history of LU. Thank you. And then Kennedy Brown, one of our students, said, awesome job, Dr. DeBoard. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, feel free to raise your hand or post in the chat. I see Bill Binicky, one of the people that I um, interviewed is present there. And uh, I just wanna say thanks to Bill for what he provided to me too. And he was a great colleague to work with as well. Well, while you're thinking of your questions, I do wanna say thank you, Dr. Board, for giving this talk. Um, also, please join us on May 18th. That is gonna be a Tuesday at 7 p.m. Our next speaker is Dr. Nadia Navarrete uh, Tindell. Um, she will be talking about Lincoln University's uh, Finca Eco Farm and the Native Plant Outdoor Lab. So if you're interested in gardening, native plants, um, various different agricultural techniques, uh, feel free to join us. That will be a live in-person as well as Zoom meeting, again, taking place on Tuesday, May 18th. And hopefully you have come up with some questions or comments for Dr. DeBoard. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing hi. Actually, I saw that Tony Holland and Robert and Patricia were on here too. Mara's raised her hand apparently. Hi, Kurt. Hey. <laughs> nice job with the presentation. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you some about um, what was happening early on in psychology with some of the uh, the teachers who were teaching, for example, from James's text. Do you think that they were teaching? How do you? And I realize your information was limited. But how do you think they were teaching differently in black institutions, given that the white institutions were using the same text? Right. Um, again, I, I, the one person I know that was um, uh, using that text was uh, Benjamin Allen, who was president. Um, and he, again, he was so invested in moral character and in people and, and having his students be cultured and behaving in sophisticated way, I would imagine that it was more of an application orientation to living the good life. That's my guess uh, more than anything else. Um, and I, I'm not certain that that was done at predominantly white institutions in that way. 
I see. So just more kind of a, a, an applied take on things. Uh, and the, generally, again, the, when you look at how psychology was, um, it was emphasizing educational psychology at HBCUs, um, it was much more applied in general than it was at PWIs. Right. right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks like Dr. Holland's here to you. Well, uh, Vila's got another question. Okay. Um, so how has the, I guess I, I, I wanna say, what, what do students do now with a psychology degree? How has that changed in terms of what they, what kinds of jobs, or maybe they went on and got PhDs back in the 60s and 70s. What are your graduates doing now? How are they employed? Yeah, um, typically um, what I'm seeing is they're working in human service agencies like around the community or you know, going back home to places like Kansas City and St. Louis and, and working um, like as behavioral health technicians. But often what I hear is they'll have a couple years of experience of doing things like that at the, at the bachelor's degree and find, you know what, it's going to be really worthwhile to pursue a master's. It's going to open more doors and create opportunities for more money. So I, I think it's a, a lot of students, like I said, more recently have been going into the Lincoln program in counseling um, for pretty much straight after undergrad. But I see a large number of students going into the workforce um, and then later deciding to come back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Were there any more questions in the chat? Um, a vague one from Patricia, and I asked her a follow-up. I don't know how to, I just put it out. I don't know how to do any more. What else? Oh, did you have a specific question, Patricia? I do, and I wrote it. Is that appropriate or not? Um, I just wasn't sure what you meant by when. Oh, I'll, um, okay, I, I'll just add to it. I was going to add another one, too. I was a, um, a friend of uh, Mary Jo Williams, and some of you may remember her as the professor of art who was here for a period of time. Do you? Anybody remember? No. Okay. Well, I've always been uh, interested uh, because I think, his, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about the date, I, I have some information, but I'm just curious because I know when Lincoln Institute and then Lincoln University developed that uh, the, the uh, enrollment was uh, restricted to only to um, whatever people were called at that particular time, but Black students. And I know that there was a change probably with 1954, am I correct? And I just, I'm just curious if, if anybody is willing or wants to um, mention anything about it and uh, whether there were uh, good results or, or not comfortable results or anything about it. But I was always glad that it had happened, of course. That's my question. Actually, I, I was reading in Dr. Holland's book, uh, The Soldier's Dream Continued, um, said that um, Jefferson City closed a community college um, so there wouldn't be a duplication of services once Brown versus the Board of Education uh, was okay. decided, and that that was responsible for a large influx of white students into Lincoln University's campus. And when I look at some of the, um, um, actually, and you know, I, I didn't mention this, but uh, during that time period, um, there were student, um, student body um, government reps who reached out to hotel owners and restaurant owners in Jefferson City and yeah. actually got more integration to happen within the community at that same time. Okay. Uh, also, because there's such a large influx of white students, it's really an indicator of like how well respected the institution was as an institution of education. So um, the pictures I've seen in Arnold Park's book and in also Dr. Holland's book um, is uh, shows a pretty smooth and, and a lot of social integration uh, at the minimum. Great. I'm glad to hear that because um, I have always uh, thought that Lincoln is one of the, outs to me anyway, of outstanding um, organizations, institution in St. Aaron, Jeff City. And I've always welcomed it because of that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 
Any last questions or comments? Going once. Going twice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to say I just want to thank everybody who stayed on and 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 listen and for the questions and comments. Um, I just appreciate. It. I, it's been I've been inspired by doing this research and uh, uh, I don't want to. I don't have permission, so I'm not going to name the person by name. But one of the people I thanked has even um, talked about uh, restarting. Uh, we used to have a Ted Bryant scholarship fund and uh, and and actually offering to restart that so that it would be an endowed scholarship fund in the name of Ted Bryant. And so, um, I've been working with um, him and also Andre Greenson at um, Lincoln to um, see if we can make that happen. Great. Uh, Georgie Ann has her hand up. Okay. Yeah. I'm new to Zoom, so I don't know how this is working, but I was a uh, freshman in 1965. I worked in the Counseling and Testing Center under Ted Bryant. And our research showed that in 1965, the incoming freshman class was 55% white. Wow. So that was a big tilt. And after that, the white students continued. And But the white students were all within a 25-mile radius of Jefferson City. Oh. Just a piece of information. And I did graduate with a psych degree from Lincoln University and did qualitative and quantitative research with it. That's awesome. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think Dr. Benneke was there when I was a student, but I never had him as an instructor. Yeah. And how do I sign off now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's well, I, just click the mute on the mic i think is probably the best okay thank you <laughs> sure. this is the first thank time i've zoomed well thanks for coming i really appreciate that then that's thank awesome thank you good presentation <laughs> yes oh i'm just waving goodbye but that's what i do <laughs> oh, I, found, I found it very interesting though and I don't know whether you planned that, Kurt, but the fan motivating, um, revolving over your head through your whole presentation always kept me knowing right where you were, even though I was <laughs> a very interesting addition when we Zoom to have a fan like that. Thank you. Okay. I'm just hot. <laughs> well, sure. I was thinking you really needed it anyway. Yeah. I would. Ivica, yeah. say hi to Clara. Mm -hmm. It's Clara, but I'll say hi to Ithaca. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Ithaca. Okay. And I thought that looked a little much. No, I know. I saw no. it. And I sure, uh, since I have you, Clara and Ithaca, I sure remember you wrong. She oh, was, yes. She was a live wire when my yes. other women got together occasionally, you know. She just was right there making sure that things went well. Yes, yes. Right. I'm so happy to know more about your dad. So thank Aww. you. I, I, that was a swing bed that I got today. Oh, that's nice. Thank Here you. Know. Thank you. <laughs> well, I appreciated hearing the stories, even though some, I know a lot of stories, but it's always nice to hear new ones. So. <laughs> sure enough. All right. Vianney, your hands up. Yes, yes. So I do have a question. I uh, was interested on um, the whole idea of educational psychology. And I have to declare myself, I'm a complete ignorant in terms of psychology. It's uh, something that I uh, recently have been, uh, how can I say, educating myself by reading the psychology textbooks in, um, in uh, OpenStax. But it's just, you know, trying to, to educate myself a little bit. So do you have any textbook recommendation in educational psychology? Uh, actually, I, I don't teach educational psychology. We do have an educational psychology class. Um, Avila, do you have a text that you could recommend? It's an educational psychology text. Mm -hmm. um, the best person would be to ask um, Dr. J or um, Dr. Wood. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Also, uh, you're welcome to come to my office and look through my bookcases. I mean, you can borrow any textbook you want that I have. Awesome. 
Thanks a lot. Sure. Okay, I have a question <laughs> um, or a comment. Um, one time I belonged to a, a, a small religious uh, spiritual group here in Jefferson City. And occasionally we have, because of our uh, forum to introduce different concepts and ideas, we've had uh, faculty or students from Lincoln uh, now University who have given programs sometimes on Sunday mornings at 9.15 to 10.15 before our regular service. And I, I'll just mention one other thing that happened that was so interesting for me. We had a panel of probably five, six, seven years, maybe, maybe more. And they came and spoke, there were about four of the students who came and spoke about their, their international students. And they spoke of their country and a bit of the history about how they were here and et cetera. And um, uh, Lilia, uh, uh, hold on, Lilia, I'm not sure. I can't say the name right now. I may later. But anyway, she's from, uh, she's from Russia. And she said, I will be willing to teach Russian lessons if any of you are interested. Well, I've learned a couple of languages slightly. But anyway, I thought, OK, that sounds like a good opportunity. And I said uh, to Lilia, or I got in touch with her. And luckily, I was a student. And I came and Lilia taught me some Russian language and customs all year long from that point, uh, which had been in fall. And then um, I got to uh, have my final exam with her and another student from Russia was there. And it was just a wonderful experience for me. I never would have had it and we got to be friends. So, you know, it was a, a very enriching thing for her probably, but it certainly was for me. And I, I like that opportunity, uh, as I know some of others of my friends here, to meet not only uh, students of all ilk from Lincoln. And I see really opportunities that when organizations uh, other than at Lincoln, because I know there are plenty of them, can come and be part of or talk or explain whatever they want to say to people in the community of Jefferson City, I see it as a big bonus for our community. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming this evening. I think uh, this is a good place to wrap it up. Um, so again, thank you. And um, Kurt, if you had any final words, feel free to- uh, I'd like to thank everybody too. Thanks a lot. And again, I hope to see everyone on May 18th uh, for our next talk. Uh, feel free to follow us on Facebook or follow the library's Facebook page for more information. All right, thanks.